So, do we have like a list of topics for this, or are we just going for it? The list of topics is Unbound. I I could literally talk about Unbound for probably ten hours, and I already have Tanina in the car. She's probably tired of hearing me talk about it. <laughs> All right, Unbound it is. I didn't even know there were any other bike races going on last weekend. Were there? I think there was some race called, like, the Armed Forces Classic or something that no one attended, but... Oh, is that why Scott won? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, like, the most hotly contested crit of the year so far. There you go. <laughs> but I didn't right. win. Well, Scott, let, fourth, let's, fourth let's start with you. Let's let's start with Armed Forces real quick, because that'll only take, like, five minutes. <laughs> Unbound's All a right. big one. <laughs> All right. What is the you give like a recap forces? or something? Yeah, I mean, what is so it? So you got, what, you get fourth and third, and then you won the Omnium, is that correct? Yeah, I got fourth and fourth. And that, oh, how okay. they do the points is, like, it's just how much, what your placing is, and the lowest score wins. So I had eight points. Nice. Where the guy who got second got, like, nine points, because he got second the first day and then seventh. So it's like, this race, it's like the last hard crit in America. The, uh, at least Sunday, Sick. it's it's a one one k course and with five turns and it's a hundred laps. Nice. Hundred k, yeah. <laughs> so that means there's five hundred <laughs> corners. So How and fa- they're like, what? How fast did you guys complete a hundred k? Uh, maybe two hours and like thirteen minutes or something. Oh, so, that's smoking it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. For 500 turns, too, that were, and, like, you know, three of them are, you're, like, jumping pretty hard out of them. Like, yeah. Yeah. pretty hard sprints. Dude, that's, so like, it, the, it, the NASCAR of cycling. Yeah. Apparently, this is how all, all the crits used to be. It was, like, 100K. Mm. But now they're all, like, 60 minutes and too easy. But this one actually, like, splits up. So, so it's just... Do they pull full riders gas and race. stuff? Huh? They pull riders once you get shot off the bat. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I mean, a K like is not that long. It was like 120 starters and maybe like 50 finishers. Wow. So are you gonna win crit nationals this year or what? I'm gonna do it. I mean, <laughs> cool. Not gonna I don't crash. Know. I'm po- I'm... You're not gonna crash anyone out this year. I didn't crash anyone out. But <laughs> no. Cool. No. Scott, so, well, I'm, okay, so I'm rooting we, for you. So we were talking about this on on the other podcast, the Matchbox. Um, so there's amateur road nationals, and then there's professional road nationals. But the amateurs can compete in the pro nets. Are you doing both? Yeah, because yeah, what, like, I, can't I don't do understand. I, I don't even understand necessarily. Like, what's what's the distinction between the two? Why why is there why, like, why are there pro so nets many? Yeah, is for pros, obviously. But since there's not enough, like, registered pro teams, or registered American pros, they let amateurs do the mm. race to, like, fill in the field, basically. But what's the criteria to meet the pro status? Uh, you have to have a pro. Your team has to be either continental, pro-continental, or, like, they're called a pro team now, or world tour. Mm. So the team, I'm on Wildlife Generation. Is so it just depends on what team you're on. Yeah, pretty much. So, like, when you get a pro license on the road, you you can't just earn your pro license, like, through upgrading. Like, you can with a Cat 1 license or, like, a pro license for mountain biking. You have to join a pro team. Okay. So, yeah, that's what I wasn't – like, it, it, that's what I didn't understand. So, so you could theoretically, like, be on an amateur team one year, then a pro team the next year, then, like, go back to an amateur team and just kind of flip-flop between the two? Yeah. I don't think there's any rule that you can't do amateur nationals if you've been on a pro team. I don't mm-hmm. think so. There might be, though. Okay. That would make sense, but um, no, probably not. But then if you're like – like the, you sometimes amateur nationals is before pro nationals, and if you're top 10 or something in the crit at amateur nationals, then you can do the crit at the pro nationals, and then sometimes – they let some teams into the crit, but not the road race. But when I was on an amateur team, I paid attention to like the rules a lot more than I do now because I can't even go to amateur nationals. So I, yeah, 
I don't really care what the rules are. But they hmm. like in twenty like eighteen and twenty nineteen, it was like five amateur teams got to do pro national. So then the, it was like ranked on the like the pro road tour points was who got to do pro nationals. Hmm. So they kind of made it like a, a like a competition between teams to get into the race. But then last year, because there was so little pro teams and like it was COVID, so we didn't even have any races before pro nationals. They just, I think they just let anybody do it. You have to be like a cat one or you have to be a domestic elite team or something. So, gotcha. Cool, man. I'll be cheering for you. Anything else about Armed Forces? Was there any drama that you want to talk about? No. I mean, they didn't let us into parking. <laughs> what? On Sunday, they gave us a parking pass and everything at the hotel, and then we show up, and they don't let us park on the in the infield, and all the other teams have, like, all these tents taking up all the parking spots, and then we went one, three, four in the race and won the Omnium. Dude, one of, your, uh, one of your wildlife teammates was at unbound i rode with him for a little bit oh yeah yeah kent was there mm-hmm. yeah i forgot about that i should yeah i should have asked him about, about, ha- his, about halfway through the race i was riding with him and he's he we were like asking for time gaps to the leaders and he's like yeah if we're more than 15 minutes down i'm just gonna call it like <laughs> quit I don't, I don't know what he meant i don't know if he meant he just like you know, easy pedal to the you finish or quit, or I, I don't know how he finished either, but it sounded like he was like just doing it to compete in it. But yeah. then, like, once you get in the race, obviously you're gonna like try as hard as you can, but right, yeah, yeah. Unbound doesn't seem like the kind of race that would be fun to just go do for fun. <laughs> well, then, why are all these people doing it for fun? I, I don't yeah. understand. I don't know. It I, I mean, I, fun to me. I mean, I think it's it's like it's like uh, finishing a marathon or something, right? It's uh, yeah, sort of like you know, here's something that I accomplished. I rode 200 miles of gravel. Um, I think that's how a lot of people look at it. Yeah, but you don't you don't just say like I'm going to go have a fun day on the bike. There's a lot more fun things you could do. Yeah, I mean, personally, I I find unbound to be fun i know a lot of people really disagree yeah but, but part of it is because you're, you're competing and like <laughs> mm-hmm. you're pushing sure. yourself sure i probably wouldn't drive to the middle of kansas to go shred some <clears throat> some kansas grav just by myself but the race <laughs> makes it fun all right well let's switch to unbound this sounds cool. way more exciting um hey so one question i have so i saw on alex wild posted like a picture and it looked like he was he was like riding over some like knocked down bridge or something was that was that part of the race or i, I couldn't tell if that was like mm. in the race or uh, a random picture i mean there's plenty of sketchy creek crossings in the race could have been one of those there is a wooden bridge it's not knocked down but um okay there's actually a rider down and like seriously injured when i pa- passed the wooden bridge i think it was a hundred mile rider um and uh yeah it there's there's plenty of sketchy creek crossings, especially this year when it rained. But they, like, didn't they, they change the course to avoid some of those? So the course was going to be 204 miles, and then they avoided some of the really dangerous creek crossings, apparently, um, and it got knocked down to 200 miles flat. So mm. if there was if there was any year to go sub 10, it was definitely this year with the southern route, which is apparently faster. And the fact that it's 200 miles flat instead of like 204 or 206, how it usually is. And, uh, and yeah, that's exactly what happened. I mean, the times were insanely fast, despite it being super muddy, which you think would slow it down. But yeah, everything I saw, all the footage I saw, it looked like people were going slow. (laughs) <laughs> well like so the butt, so know? the like, the yeah granted the camera crews are gonna be at the gnarliest mud sections right they're not gonna yeah. be on the the chill sections which is the majority of the race um but so apparently so last year the the race went north and i think the year before that it went north as well and i think when it goes north 
the terrain is a little bit slower and there's a higher risk of flatting, uh, which is why so many people got flats last year. Um, and, and people are saying, I, I've heard people say that the really fast times this year is just because it's the Southern route, but people are forgetting that this is not the first time that the race has gone South. In fact, the last time that the race went South was in 2018. And I was at that race and Ted King's winning time was 1045. So it's not like you go South and automatically everyone's time is going to be super fast. Um, I think, so I think you, probably do you think like the level is just higher or something. Well, I think, I think there's two things. So the mud definitely didn't help. I think that if it had been less muddy, obviously it would have been faster, but I think there's two things. I think the level every single year just gets higher. And this year is the high, the highest level it's ever been. Last year was the highest level it had ever been before that. It's just like every single year, you know, yeah. now, now there's guys from Europe coming to race it. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's, it's the highest level it's ever been, which is part of it. And then I think the other part of it, um, is that it was cool. Usually unbound is a really hot race. And I think people just, just, you know, they just die in the heat in the second half of the race. And, uh, it wasn't hot. I mean, if anything, it was kind of cold. Um, I think it rained out there and I think maybe the high was in the upper seventies, but the fact that you were drenched with rainwater, like there's no, there was no overheating. Right. So I think that was a huge factor. Um, so even though the course was muddy from the rain, I think the rain actually helped the average speed be higher because people weren't overheating like they normally do. So you yeah, went so to Texas for like a month and it wasn't even hot. <laughs> yeah, it was completely useless. I was riding in 95 degrees in Texas every single day and there was no point in being heat acclimated. I mean, maybe a little bit, like maybe it helped a little bit with my blood volume and everything, but like it wasn't hot. So there, there wasn't a point in that, but, um, were you cold ever at all? Like, did you like, did yeah. people, were people wearing warmers and when stuff? it was, uh, no, because in the morning it wasn't raining. And it wasn't, mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't that cold. It was, I don't know, 60. Uh, but like midway through the race, it started pouring rain and I was, I was a little bit cold. I could have used arm warmers or something. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when I, so I, I like tuned in to, uh, the live feed, like shortly after that went live. Um, mm -hmm. but before that I like went on Instagram and just like flipped through all the live updates, whatever that unbound was doing on their Instagram page, uh, which was pretty good actually. Um, and they said, when the live feed first came on, the announcers were saying that the first 75 miles, the average speed was 25 miles an hour. Was that accurate? No, it wasn't. <laughs> okay. Because I, I, mean, I, <laughs> I thought that seemed way excessive. I mean, like 23, I could see, but 25 so miles can, an hour. I, no, it, if anything, the average speed was actually faster in the second half of the race. I think because the second half of the race had a slight tailwind. Mm. But um, y you can go to the results page and look at Ivar Slick, the dude who won. Um, he, you can look at his his average speed splits, and the the highest it ever was was like maybe it was twenty two for one section, but I think it was in the twenties and twenty ones for most of the sections. It was never twenty five. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I thought that seemed kind of crazy because that would mean. Like the winning speed was like 21 and a half miles an hour for the whole mm -hmm. thing. So that would have meant that they like severely dropped off that pace after 75 miles. Yeah. I, didn't they, didn't, like it. they didn't drop off the pace. I think the, the second hundred miles was actually faster than the first hundred miles, which is like unheard of at unbound. Almost always at unbound, the first hundred is faster than the second hundred. And again, I think that's just because it gets hot in this, in the second half of the day. And that the speeds drops drop because people's power drops off with the heat. Sure. So with the competition being so much higher this year, was there more chaos at the front, like earlier on in the race? Just because there were yeah. more people that were up there. There were crashes. There were crashes. So I was I was doing kind of a unique pacing strategy, so I didn't actually spend a lot of time at the front. Um, but from what I saw in the first twenty miles, there were there were a lot of crashes and people mm -hmm. getting flats, obviously. I mean, that always happens, but, um, 
Yeah, what is your unique pacing strategy? Like every, both times I've done Unbound, I have felt fine in the first hundred miles. Not fine, but you know, felt good enough in the first hundred miles, and then the second hundred miles is where it hits you, and you crack. And that's like ninety five percent of people's experience. If you ask, if you ask most people who are trying to win the race and stay with the front group how their unbound went, they'll be like, "Yeah, cracked in the second half." It's it's like universal. Yeah, right? No shit. <laughs> right. It's two hundred. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, so I so I was like I was like I'm gonna try to prevent this from happening by riding at. I'm going to try to do even splits. I'm going to try to do 20 miles per hour for the first hundred and the second hundred. 20 miles per hour is last year's winning average speed. And I was thinking, if I have even splits for this race, as opposed to burning a bunch of energy in the first half and then dying in the second half, I'll bet you I can catch a lot of people in the second half and finish pretty well. Um, and uh, the plan went perfectly i averaged 20 for both halves uh i just didn't anticipate that the win that everybody else's average speed would be so high <laughs> you know what i mean so and also it wasn't hot so people didn't die in the second half like they usually do so um i ended up 25th um didn't have a lot of issues out there there was tw there were two times where i heard air coming out of my tire but the sealant got it and then there was one time where I went off course for about two miles and had to get back on. So instead of doing 200 flat, I had like 202 miles. So does, do they mark the course at all? Like any major intersections or anything? Or is it all on your head unit? No, it's all on your head unit. <laughs> the whole thing? The whole thing, yeah. The, not, not one bit of it is marked. Wow. Do you do you bring a spare head unit with you in case it yours breaks or something? Well, my head unit lasts the whole race, but I imagine that if you're one of these finishers that's like taking, you know, 20 hours to finish, that's definitely a consideration. Yeah, like yeah. what if you crash and it, you know, busts on the gravel yeah, or that something? Yeah, that too. I mean, um I guess they've got cue sheets I, and I, stuff, you could probably pull that up. Yeah, I know some people um have run uh or have had a spare head unit with them like you know just yeah. like they have just like they have a spare tube they've got a second head unit <laughs> um you know i think i think i saw colin strickland from last year his bike check had that i don't know if we're allowed to say his name but <laughs> um he still exists <laughs> he still exists yeah so was this was it um it was live streamed, right? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the the live on like what Flow Sports or something? Yeah, it was on mm -hmm. Flow Sports. The live feed came on six hours into the race. Okay, mm. I didn't even try to watch it because as soon as it's Flow Sports, I'm always just like, ah, eh, you got to pay for that. So yeah, yeah. I, I've <laughs> heard I've heard mixed. Unfortunately, things about... you don't get what you're paying for either. I've heard I mean, mixed. Yeah, things, yeah. Mixed things about the coverage, and I've. I've tried to contact them to get uh, footage to make videos, um, which I think would be beneficial for them because I would give them a shout out. I'd be like, hey, this footage is from Flow Sports. Go subscribe to Flow Sports. Thanks for the footage. And they are not very responsive, which is a bit frustrating. So, yeah. um, so I, don't, I don't even try at this point. I just use my own footage, but... Did you do any filming out there while you were racing this time? Yeah, I had I had a really small camera with me. It was it's like that twenty five gram um uh what's it called? Instago. So Does that last for ten hours? No, it doesn't. I have it <laughs> I have it set to uh record for thirty seconds and then turn off. So I just get snippets of the race. If something's interesting, it happens, I reach down, turn it on real quick, and I don't even have to turn it off. It turns off automatically after thirty seconds of recording. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Because that way you don't you know, so many people with GoPros, they turn turn it on trying to get a quick quick bite and then they forget about it and then all of a sudden they've recorded the first two hours of the race and they've got They've got not like 
they didn't have any footage from the rest of the race. So, right. so did you get some footage from when it was like torrential downpouring? I think so. Hopefully, Sweet. hopefully the camera still works because it definitely got <laughs> soaked. My whole bike is just thrashed. Like, I there was one section that was so it it was like trying to ride on ice. I don't. I, I, Andrew, I was riding with Andrew Lesby, and he rode this section, which I'm I still don't know how he did it. I. I was trying to ride this section and like I crashed. My arrow bars went straight into the mud. My whole handlebars were just covered with mud. I could like barely grip them after that. Um, That's what you get for using arrow bars. Yeah, we should talk about arrow bars because because if there was any drama from the weekend, it was definitely <laughs> arrow bar drama. <laughs> there's all there every single year. There's arrow bar drama at at Unbound, and it so... and this year did not d- disappoint, in my opinion. So, the fact that you rode sub 10 hours and still had, like, to deal with some chaos, I mean, that's Mm -hmm. crazy. Well, Unbound is about chaos. People need to realize that you're not going to have a perfect race at Unbound. You're going to have a flat. You're going to bonk. You're going to crack. Something's going to happen with your bike. Like, like mechanically, uh, I I did have my gears skipping really bad for about 20 miles early on in the race. And I was like, dude, do I have a bent link? Like literally every pedal stroke, my gears are skipping. And when I got to the aid station, I just threw some lube on it and that fixed it luckily. But it's like, it's like one of these races where there, something bad is going to happen to you. So it's just, if you're going to do that race, you got to keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, do you want to, do you want to talk about like your bike setup at all? Like, did you do anything different with your bike setup this year? Well, what was the drama with the arrow bar? We'll get to that, man. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. That's part of the bike okay. setup. A... <laughs> <laughs> Scott's just sitting in the corner. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> Scott's got his arrow bar boxing gloves on right now. I, I don't, th- I don't think I can talk much about my bike setup. Um, but, uh, if, if you stay tuned to what factors got common. Uh, you'll know all about it soon enough. Oh like, do, God, do you lame. run like electronic shifting or, or mechanical shifting? Electronic shifting, and I think that's probably important when it's muddy because your the cables yeah. can get gunked up with mud, and then it's hard to shift. Yeah. Cool. And I I usually run road shoes, but I'm really glad I didn't because I had to walk a couple sections. But you were. Do you run? Do you ever run road pedals? Yeah. I actually, I, I take that back. I actually ran road shoes, but with mountain bike pedals. Okay, that's what I was gonna um, ask because you had like the Giro lace up shoes on, didn't you? Giro lace up shoes with the Crank Brothers three hole adapter to Crank Brothers egg beater pedals. Uh, you ran Crank Brothers pedal. <laughs> what? <laughs> Those things gotta be dead for sure. Yeah, they're blown, dude. The whole bike, <laughs> like my my front wheel, if you spin it, it does about one rotation before it stops. Dude, do you know how many watts that is? It's a lot. Dude. <laughs> I don't want to think about it. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it's funny. So, if if you listen to the Matchbox podcast, you know Drew Dillman. Um, him and I go back and forth on the on the marginal gains conversation. I'm a marginal gains guy. He he's the kind of guy who's like marginal gains. Why don't you just pedal harder? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, we had an interesting text conversation going about this this sub ten hour finish because I I finished like a minute and some change under ten hours. It was like nine fifty eight something. Any one of these marginal gains that that uh, Drew is constantly rolling his eyes at could have been the difference there between getting a sub ten hour and not getting a sub ten hour. So yeah, but clearly the the biggest marginal gain had to be the error bars. So let's talk about that. Yeah, let's talk about it. <laughs> so, so the drama started with uh, Pete Stetna started this email chain about the arrow bars, and the title of the email ch- chain? yeah email chain with kind of like probably who he thought was going to be in the top twenty, right? Um, it didn't include it was it didn't include everyone, but just the people he thought were going to be competition, I guess. Were you included? I wasn't included in the original one, but Ian Boswell uh, forwarded the whole email chain to me. So, <laughs> um, 
so I got I got to see all the emails. Um, he must have known you were going to be t- top twenty five. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so I think that so Pete Stetna's stance on arrow bars is kind of he's not pro or against arrow bars. He's kind of like. Uh, you know, if everyone's going to run them, then I want to run them. But if no one's going to run them, then I don't need to run them. Whereas I'm like, I will run arrow bars if it's an advantage. I don't care what anyone says. And people like Jeff Kabush is, I is like, I will not run arrow bars no matter what anyone else is doing. Right. So there are two opposite sides of the spectrum are me and Jeff Kabush on arrow bars. And then Pete, I would say he's, he's like in the middle, right? Um, so he starts, he starts this email chain and the title of the email chain is arrow bars, comma, democracy. And I guess what he's trying to do is be like, are you guys running arrow bars? Should we make a petition to not run arrow bars? Like, what is the consensus here? And I feel like, I feel like the people who were running, who were going to run arrow bars just didn't want to speak up. And the people who were not going to run arrow bars were very vocal about how they didn't want to run arrow bars. So, you know, I don't know, like Payson, Ted King, Ted King wasn't even there, but you know, some, some, some real arrow bar haters spoke up and they were like, we are not running arrow bars, uh, you know, which is fine. And, and so the consensus was kind of like, okay, no arrow bars. Right. And then I don't, I don't know what happened in between that, but then, Pete put out a video uh, and he was on his Instagram the day before. And he's like, yeah, I'm not going to run like the full on arrow bars, but I'm going to run these mini, these sort of like <laughs> mini arrow bars. Uh, as well, a- what, one second. Wouldn't that be worse? Cause like you're using them, but you don't have like a full grip on them. So you're, that's like almost the most dangerous thing you could use. Yeah. He was saying it's, it's, less dangerous than doing the the puppy paws thing that got banned by the uci where you're just laying your forearms yeah. on the bar and not grabbing onto anything uh which i guess is true but um you know i i don't know people can debate about what is more or less safe the mini arrow bars or the full arrow bars or no arrow bars um to be i'll, I'll be honest i think when people bring up safety they're not actually concerned about safety. They just don't want to look lame. That's that's my honest opinion. Also, when it comes to safety, like it's a dangerous sport, right? <laughs> like, exactly. Like, like, like exactly. Are you gonna like? Are you gonna ban like drafting too close to someone because you know they could stop suddenly and ru- you run into the back of them? Or yeah, I've yeah. heard people in the last like couple weeks complaining about like certain crit courses and stuff, and I'm like. There's a reason, like, you have breaks, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, they can make it, you know, a little safer with barriers and stuff, but... Right. If you just want to yeah. race on a straight highway or something, then that's, like, lame. So, <laughs> yeah, if you I don't want to crash, then don't go to the race. Don't compete. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like when the UCI banned the, the Super Tuck, and a lot... I, I was like, why are they banning the Super Tuck? I mean, I don't even know of somebody who's crashed using the Super Tuck. They were just anticipating that someone would, right? Um, and I was just like, I was like, well, if you think it's too dangerous, you don't have to Super Tuck if you don't want to. Yeah. You know? Well, they banned the Super Tuck, I think, because like they didn't want people seeing that on TV and then trying it when they don't know what they're doing, like at home and right. crashing. So that's so that's uh. That's anti arrow bar guys. That's their same argument, which I, which, you know, makes sense. Like if we, if, if the pros know how to use arrow bars and aren't going to crash with arrow bars, whatever, but then there's going to be a bunch of other people who want to copy what the pros are doing and they're going to run arrow bars and they're not going to know how to use them, you know, fair enough. But like, um, you know, I don't know. I'm kind of in agreement with you. Like cyclists have to take risks sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean, you're signing up for a 200 mile race. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think the risk of like severe dehydration when it's a hot race is probably way higher than accidentally crashing with your arrow bars. Or even getting like run over by like a deer or a cow or something out there is probably more likely than to <laughs> yeah, crash because you're in an arrow. There, there was a pack of deer that ran across the road. I think it was in front of Sophia. 
Um, Lauren, like Lauren pretty, pretty Crescenzo late. has a video. A deer ran like an inch in front of her. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was Lauren. But yeah, like yeah. pretty late in the race too. Like almost almost took her out. Right. Now that combo between a deer and being in the arrow bars. Well, she was. The brakes, <laughs> she was. Right. She was in the arrow bars and the deer ran <laughs> yeah. in front of her. Yeah. So like, yeah. Anyway, so and 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 the thing that I get that. I want to emphasize here is that how handlebars should look on a bike is completely arbitrary. If, if every single road bike got sold with aero bars and that was just standard equipment for road bikes, no one would think that aero bars are ugly because that that's what they're used to. It's kind of like when 29ers came into mountain biking and everybody was like, Oh, 29ers look so ugly. And now if you see a 26 inch wheeled bike, you're like, is that a kid's bike? You know, <laughs> Probably. um, so it's like this, this whole, this whole thing, like, oh, they don't look cool or whatever. It's, it's a complete, that's completely arbitrary. They would look cool if everyone did them. If every pro ran aero bars at gravel races, people would be like, if you showed up without aero bars on your gravel bike, people would be like, what is this guy? A noob? You know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> so it, that, that's, that's completely arbitrary in my opinion. Um, what just like it, that it looks ugly that it looks argument? ugly yeah that's like an actual argument yes it's an actual argument and in my that opinion people use against arrow bars i i've seen it online i've seen people <laughs> say that and also this is a this is not a like beauty pageant it's a bike race like who cares i will say i i do think those shorter arrow bars do look pretty sick compared to like the big mm. praying mantis looking arrow bars like yep. i think the bike looks way cooler with those short ones okay sure but yeah um, um so i mean like so go, going back to the arrow bar thing i mean just look at how many guys are running arrow bars and where they finished like of the top 10 what eight guys were running arrow bars or something like that seven guys is a lot yeah yeah and i mean you know um i don't know it's it right it it's an advantage. Um, I was having a, a conversation with Ian Boswell that, to me, this is actually a way more interesting conversation than whether or not arrow bars are in the spirit of gravel or whether they're safe or not. Like, that's stuff that I'm like, ugh, like eye roll, right? But this was a way more interesting conversation that I had with Ian Boswell about whether or not they're actually an advantage. Um, so check this out. If you, Arrow Coach did some testing on. Aero, aero bars, all, all these different positions, when you're not using your aero bars, like you're just riding and you have aero bars on your bike, but you're not using them, that's actually pretty un-aerodynamic. And it's costing you, according to them, nine watts at whatever speed they tested it at. So, and, and when you're using the aero bars versus a aero hoods position, which is arguably the most aero position you can get in, with normal handlebars, it's like a 17 watt difference between the arrow hoods position and the arrow bars position, right? So, so now you're thinking, okay, arrow bars are costing me nine watts if I'm not using them, but I'm saving 17 watts when I am using them. So now it's like, okay, let's, somebody could easily do some, and apparently Specialized has done this, do some calculations where you're like, okay, how much time in this race do I need to spend in the aero bars for them to actually be faster? Because there's definitely a point at which I'm not spending enough time in the aero bars and they're actually slowing me down. I don't know exactly where that point is, but I saw a ton of people out there who had aero bars on their bike and were just not using them ever. We're, versus me, like I spend time training in the aero bars and if I'm on the front pulling or I'm solo, and it's not a climb, I'm using them pretty much. Or if it's some technical downhill, like I'm pretty much exclusively in my arrow bars if I'm hitting the wind, right? So th to me, that's a more interesting conversation than like, is it safe? Is it in the spirit of gravel? You know, like, I don't, I don't care about that. I think the spirit of the spirit of gravel is a meme at this point, right? Um, <laughs> like what there's all these pros doing it or you know suppose mm -hmm. pros and it's like the most talked about race 
in the right. country, basically. Yeah. But so it, one thing I noticed with um, Ian Boswell was interesting. Uh, he was running a hip hydration pack instead of a backpack. Did you see that? Yeah, he ran that at Gravel Locos, and he his reason. I talked to him about that as well. His reasoning was that a he thought that the I don't know if he's tested this or not, um, but this is what he told me is that he thought the hip pack was more aerodynamic than having a pack on your back. And so, I think it'd be less fatiguing because you don't have as much sure, weight weighing sure. down on your on your back. Yeah, um, probably probably uh, cooler as well. Yeah, oh, totally. Not that, not that being and cool easier really to get off. Like, like race, if you need but... to swap one out, or, or you just want to ditch it. Just... Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty so, good idea. Has anyone? Does any? Is anyone running like a like a Camelback bladder, like stuffed down their jersey, or have like a custom jersey that has a like, um, pocket in it for a bladder or anything instead of running a, a Camelback? I don't know of anyone who's doing that. I, I yeah, I've heard of the custom like jersey thing with like the with having like a sleeve in your jersey or something like that. It yeah, makes it more. I mean, I don't know anything about aerodynamics, but that would think I would think yeah. that, that would be more aerodynamic. Yeah, than I'm surprised there aren't more people doing like custom frame bags with a hydration bladder in it or something like that. Yeah, Colin Strickland. I thought that his solution last year was genius. To did, be that, did he do that? He had a custom frame bag with a bladder in it. And and he's not the only one who runs a frame bag with a bladder, but his looked like it improved the air. I mean, you know, not tested, right? But his looked like it improved the aerodynamics of the bike, not, you know, not made it worse, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But it, did you it, run a hydration pack at all? It, it wasn't hot enough. Like, I had four bottles with me, and that was... That was plenty. At no point was I running out of fluid. Where do you, where do you fit four bottles at? Three on the frame and one in my back pocket. Okay. Honestly, I could have gotten away with just the three on the frame. Would have been fine. Um. Yeah, I, if if it was a hot race, I'd probably need even more liquid than four bottles. But it it wasn't hot. It wasn't necessary. Um. But if we if we go back to this email chain real quick, so so people people are. <laughs> People are kind of deciding, and I think that the only one who gave pushback on the actual email chain is uh, this guy Jasper from Holland, who won Gravel Locos, and he's an arrow bar guy. In fact, I think he's got like some, I don't know, three three printed arrow bars. They look, they're like the kind that mold to your forearm, right? Mm -hmm. Sick. Um, like they look like they're straight he... up off of a World Tour time trial bike. Nice. Is he one of the uh, Dutch mafia guys that they were talking about? Yeah, okay. yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, hopefully, they so, don't hunt us down now. <laughs> no, they seem like they're nice dudes. Uh, I've talked to Jasper a little bit, but he he gave a, I think he gave a little bit of pushback on the email chain, but he was really the only pro arrow bar guy to do so. My teammate Adam Roberge texted me, and he was like, "What do you think about this email chain?" And I was like, I don't care what anyone else thinks about aero bars. They're going to be on my bike if it's not against the rules. And he was like, yeah, man, that that's awesome. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and, and I was like, I, I texted him and I was like, I hope that they all decide not to run aero bars because it's a less of an advantage for them and more of an advantage for me. Like, you know. Um, but anyway, so, so Pete... Pete ends up running these small arrow bars, and then there was like, I, I think Payson put up a post which I thought was hilarious, and he's an anti arrow bar guy, but I I love this post where he was talking about, um, he was like he was like something about how you know these guys are going against our gentleman's agreement not to run arrow bars with like some small arrow bars that for some reason don't count, and then it's a picture of him doing like the Superman pose on his bike and he's like this is the only arrow advantage i need um <laughs> like really poking fun at probably pete i would have to imagine i mean granted uh keegan and russell were also running these mini arrow bars when they said they weren't going to um but i feel like if it was if that post was poking fun at anyone it was probably pete um so 
you know, I mean, I get, I get where, I get where Pete's coming from. Like he cares about this race and he, he doesn't want to give up an advantage, but it's just, it's just kind of like, I, my mentality is like, I don't care if you run arrow bars and I don't care if you don't run arrow bars. It's like gravel is kind of cool because there's no rules and it's sort of run what you brung. Like if you want to ride a fat bike, you can ride a fat bike. If you want to try to make it through Unbound on a freaking time trial bike, try to do that. You're probably going to get a flat, but like, you know, it's like whatever, whatever bike you want to try to ride at Unbound, do it, you know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, what, that... was, what was even the point of the email chain? Just to talk about it? Well, I... Or was there an opinion? The opinion was like, let's all band together to make like a petition that us front runners are not going to run arrow bars. But then... Then there were enough people running arrow bars that it was kind of like, ah, screw it, we're running arrow bars anyway. <laughs> so, like, the people yeah. who started the email chain ran arrow bars still. So. Yes, Correct. they did. Um, so, I don't know. I th arrow, arrow nubs? I, don't, I mean, I don't know what you... <laughs> I mean, they're just like, they, they were those far, right, the far yeah. carbon ones or whatever. Um, and I've seen those before. And I do think they look cool. Um, but yeah, they're just like, it's like a little like um, like horseshoe basically that sticks out from the center of your bar. And they're like, yeah, it barely, it barely surpasses the length of like your computer mount. Right. And it's a pretty nifty product too, because, you know, going back to, to what I was talking about, where if you're not actually using your arrow bars, it's costing you, it's costing you watts because having arrow bars and not using them is pretty unaerodynamic. These small bars that are just kind of like, in the front of your bike are probably not adding that much to your CDA. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, yeah. So if, if you don't use them, it's probably not that big a deal versus normal arrow bars, like bulky long arrow bars are definitely costing you something if you don't touch them. Yeah, so when I was watching the live feed and there was like, I think five guys with, you know, that were part of the uh, the front group with, I don't know, 10 or 15 miles to go or something like that. Um, they kept mentioning how the winner, is it Ivar Slick? That's his name, right? Ivar or Ivar. Um, some, yeah. Yeah. So they kept mentioning like, oh yeah, it looks like Ivar is, uh, you know, he's not, he's not pulling through. He's not, you know, he must be hurt and he must be suffering or maybe he's trying to save his energy. But if you looked close enough, he was just sitting on the back in his arrow mm. bars like he wasn't mm. he wasn't rotating because he was in his arrow bars the whole time um mm. yeah and and he was the only one that was doing that i mean which sure sure I mean, it worked I yeah guess. I, mean, I mean he had more I energy mean, in the sprint sa saving energy for the sprint for sure um i mean he he's cool. he's uh definitely the biggest guy in that group i don't know how much he weighs but i mean i saw the podium um we're talking about keegan boswell uh, Ten Dam and Alexi, those those four dudes are not that big. I mean, this guy probably outweighed them by twenty pounds. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win a sprint. There's plenty of big guys that aren't good at sprinting, but yeah, he's not a good guy to toe the line. Back to the email chain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, he, if he only if he only emailed the top twenty guys, like. Or what? Uh, was it all men, or was there females? Oh, dude, this. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up. So I, th I thought about responding. I uh, so I didn't. I didn't respond to the email at all. I'm like, I'm running arrow bars. Don't care what anyone else thinks. I'm running them. So I just didn't respond. But this is what I thought about responding. I was like, I thought about responding. Why didn't you include Lauren Di Crescenzo? last year's winner who won with arrow bars or any of the other women for that matter. Um, like, do you care about preserving the essence of gravel or whatever, or do you just care about losing an advantage to your competition? You know what I mean? Because totally. if, if we're trying, if we're trying to put on this show, like, Hey, we don't, you know, uh, people who are winning this race don't need arrow bars. So you shouldn't need arrow bars too. Then you should get the women on board, right? you should get the women on board with not running arrow bars. Cause pe people look up to the women as well. Like what are the women doing? Um, they're not running arrow bars. Okay. I'm not going to run arrow bars, but actually 
went, you know, Sophia ran arrow bars, Lauren de Crescenza ran arrow bars. I think it makes a lot of sense in the women's field because um, probably, you know, the men's race uh, for the past two years has come down to a sprint finish. You don't necessarily need arrow bars if you're in a pack all the way to the finish and then you have to sprint. But if you're spending time out there solo, like Sophia did or like Lauren de Crescenzo did, arrow bars are really helpful. So. Yeah, I totally agree. But again, going back to the email chain, because I think this is really interesting. Um, <laughs> shouldn't he be like emailing if the issue is safety? Mm -hmm. The people he emailed are probably the people who are the most, what do you call it? Like, they're not going to crash using arrow bars. It's all the yeah. amateur riders who have less experience. It's the most experienced and most skilled riders in the race right. that are arguing over the arrow bars when yeah, I they mean, can handle it, right? I mean, it's I this... Mean, like I said, it's the same thing as the super tuck argument, right? So a pro can do a super tuck and be fine, but we don't want, you know kids at a junior race doing a super tuck and crashing i mean they're making the, the the argument is the same for the arrow bars like a pro can ride arrow bars no problem you know so, somebody else you know who's not as good a bike handler might might mess themselves up running arrow bars you know it would be a good spinoff to make the lifetime grand prix even more exclusive is that only lifetime grand prix entrance or whatever can mm -hmm. use arrow bars and <laughs> other people competing in the race can't use arrow bars i'm actually i'll be honest i'm actually worried that they're going to do it the other way around i'm actually worried that that they're going to say lifetime grand prix riders can't run arrow bars everybody else can uh which would suck in my opinion i so i i've, I've also heard pros say i you know like Ah, uh, man, I wish that arrow bars were just banned so that it would make our decision easier. Like, if they were banned, I'd totally be in, on board with them banning them. But since they're not banned, I gotta run them because everyone else is running them. That's not my opinion. I don't want them to right. ban them. Well, in your opinion, is like, the decision's easy. If they're mm -hmm. legal, you're running them. If they're illegal, yeah. you're not. I mean, you know, like, that's... The, so, the analogy that I make a lot, and I... And, and the, I feel like the world tour has this mentality and, and people are like, oh, let, like, let's not bring world tour mentality into gravel. It's like gravel can be for anyone. Gravel can be for for somebody just trying to finish who's having a fun day out there. You know, the last thing that they're thinking about is aerodynamics. They're just trying to make it to the finish. Right. And and gravel can be for somebody who's arrowed out trying to get the fastest time possible. Right. Gravels for everyone. But anyway, so so I feel like the World Tour has this mentality, and motor racing definitely has this mentality, and I think this is such a cool mentality to have, where in motor racing, like you know F1, MotoGP, any sort of car racing, any sort of motorcycle racing, they are doing whatever they can within the rules to make their car or motorcycle as fast as possible within yeah. the rules. Why would you not do that with bike racing? Why would you not say, okay, what is the fastest bike that I can possibly have at Unbound within the Unbound rules? I can't have a motor, all right, but I can have arrow bars, all right, yeah, I'm I'm on board with that. Like, okay, you can't run arrow bars in in pro road racing because it's against the rules, but that's not a rule in gravel. Like, in my mind, I. I ran arrow bars at my very first gravel race, and it was it was a no brainer for me. I was like, arrow bars are faster. Done. They're on my bike. I, I didn't even have to think twice about it. Um, it's actually, it, I'll be honest, it's very interesting to see people's opinion about this this whole arrow bar situation because I feel like it kind of gives you an insight into how they think about racing, if you know what I mean. Um. Like I, 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 I'll be honest. I have a really hard time understanding the mentality of somebody who's like, "Nah, I'm not gonna run arrow bars. Whatever." Like it's, it's like me trying to struggle to understand where Drew is coming from when he's like, "Eh, I'll just pedal harder. I don't need arrow socks." I'm like, "Just put them on, dude. Just put them on, and you'll go faster." You, you can do both. <laughs> right, like. I, it, it's 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 hard for me to understand that mentality, to be honest with you. But but it's it's interesting to me. It's almost like 
you know, I, um, it's like, it's, it's like psychology, right? You know, how, yeah, I mean, how are in people some ways, thinking about bike racing? In some ways I, I'm envious of those people. Cause I'm, I'm similar to you, Dylan. Like I, I geek out on all things gear related. Like I always want to have the best stuff if I can, or at least the stuff that's going to make the most difference. Mm-hmm. Um, I, but I envy someone who just like, who can roll up on like their Kmart bike and still kind of kick ass. You know, Dude, I, we're talking about Scott right now. <laughs> dude, Scott is like, Scott is like, uh, oh, dude, it's got wheels. It'll be fun. <laughs> Scott Scott ran road shoes in his first UCI cyclocross race last year. Like, that's just because I didn't have mountain bike shoes. That's Scott, what I mean. Like, Scott has I one. I would have probably not shown up to that cyclocross race because I didn't have mountain bike shoes. <laughs> Scott Scott has won a collegiate downhill mountain bike race on like a blown out. Cannondale scalpel XC bike. <laughs> yeah, but I, if I had a better bike, I would have ran it. Right, sure. I'm just not. I guess that makes sense. Like, I'm just not. I'm gonna do it because it's fun, right? Right. <laughs> and you don't let it like you know get in your head. Yeah, like, it doesn't oh, get. It doesn't affect. Better. Yeah, it doesn't phase you. Yeah. Yeah. Or else you're like losing the race before you start it. Right. Yeah. Where yeah, like if, sure. if 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 Dylan's if the morning of unbound dylan went to pull up his aero socks and both of them ripped in half he would have probably been thinking about that for like the first four hours of unbound. <laughs> right Dude, i have a problem actually pull, putting on socks too violently and just ripping them <laughs> yeah man i've it, got like an issue you, you i need ha- to like chill out with my socks putting on or whatever. <laughs> dude you do have to be very careful about putting on the aero socks you gotta do it gingerly <laughs> um but yeah i mean i so, like, I, as far as the aero bar conversation is going, we don't have to spend this entire episode talking about aero bars. I feel like we already I have. I mean, we pretty much already have, so. I know. But, but uh, I mean, I, like, I get where Pete's coming from, but, but, I, I don't know. It's, it's just interesting for me to, to see where, see where other people's heads are at in this conversation, because it's something that I, that I, it's like, I don't understand. I don't understand why you wouldn't want an advantage, right? Well, it's it's like somebody's like email. it's like somebody's like here's an advantage. Would you like it? And people are like, nah, I'm good. I don't need it. I'm like, why? Why would you not take it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could say the same thing about like a questionable supplement or yeah, or, but you know, I don't want to say a drug, but like, but there's a point like, at which it goes against the rules, right? So. I, yeah, but then, I, there, the, like, uh, Tramadol was banned a couple years ago, and people mm-hmm. were taking that in the Peloton. And then I could see the riders, like, banding together, almost like forming a union. This is what this email chain sounds like. It's like a gravel oh, yeah. union, almost. Yeah. And then saying, let's ban this so that we're all safe. Right. Right. Sure. So there, people are still going to use it because they're like, oh, I'm going to get the advantage. But if it was banned, then nobody can use it. Yeah. So, I mean, if we're going into the area of talking about uh, drugs and when you can and can't take, I mean, I think the line for me is, is it in the rules? It, you know, is it against the rules or is it not against the rules? If something's against the rules, I'm not going to do it. But if it's if it's not against the rules, um, you know, I'm all for it. I, I don't I, this drug that you're referencing right now or supplement or whatever it is. I'm not familiar with, so I don't know if it's like bad for your oh, health or something. I've, I've never obviously never taken it, but it was like making people uh, uh, allegedly making people like drowsy. Like it makes you oh. real drowsy, but it's like a painkiller. Gotcha. So then p- people say that they were like not like falling asleep, but like losing concentration and causing crashes in the Peloton. And it's like a powerful painkiller. Mm. But then it got banned. I think due to like a lot of riders complaining about it. Same, yeah. similar to Arrow Bar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but the pro, the, but gravel isn't like sanctioned. Like I guess there's the lifetime. Grand well, so Prix, so, but... so there are there are gravel races that just ban Arrow Bars. And, yeah, and unbound, but it's like an event to event. Right, Unbound not... could do that, but um, like for example, the BWR series, you can't run Arrow Bars for any BWR yeah. race. So, and you're fine with that, right? Yeah, if it's against the rules, then I'm not going to use them, obviously. Obviously. So, okay, so question. So those little dinky arrow bars 
that they used would be banned, considered banned or against the rules at BWR, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why did they think that it was going to be okay to like have this like gentleman shake on no aero bars and then show up with those things? Yeah, that's almost worse. Like, that's like the worst thing you could do <laughs> to say, let's all not use aero bars and then show up with aero bars. And then show up with them. Um, like, did he yeah. see everyone had aero bars and like go back to his car and like pop them <laughs> well, or something? Well, dude, the Dutch mafia guys, like the, the Ivar Slick guy and uh, Jasper, they were they were not giving in. They're like, sorry, I'm running aero bars, right? And I think that's that's who like the american dudes were the most worried about and rightly so i mean ivar won the race and jasper won gravel locos these dudes are no joke um so they were the most worried about these guys and these guys are like i i don't care i'm running arrow bars so it's like it's got us work like the americans it's got us worried it's like uh i was not gonna run arrow bars but the the dutch mafia is running arrow bars so i got i have to run them now you know what i mean then why not just go with the full aero bars, though? Like, that's what I don't yeah. understand. Like, yeah. to me, it seemed like they put those little ones on. And I didn't know about this email chain. So I just thought that maybe, like, Keegan and Russell, like, tried these things out and they looked cool or whatever. And mm -hmm. they thought it was, like, you know, maybe a comfort position or something. I didn't know about this email chain or whatever. But yeah. to me, it's like, if you're, if you're not going to go, if you're going to go against your word, then just go all the way. Like, actually give yourself the advantage that you're looking for. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't so know. So one thing I got to say, though, so so on the feed, they they were talking about the Dutch Mafia and Ivar, and they were they were saying, like, how Ivar is, like, a marginal gains guy, and he, like, does all these, you know, things to make mm -hmm. himself more aero, and they were talking about the aero bars and stuff like that. Um, the, 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 the photo finish of him coming across the line, though, dude, his arms are so hairy. <laughs> like, the dude doesn't shave his arms. We were talking about that, like, in, mm -hmm. like, middle of last week. So I was asking you, Dylan, if you shaved your arms, yeah. and I was like, "Dude, how how does that guy like do everything but shave his arms?" Like, yeah. Do you remember? Do you remember what my response was to "Do you shave your arms?" You said you shave everything. <laughs> no, <laughs> my response was was the minute the minute that I heard that sh shaving your legs was more arrow and faster, I shaved my arms as well. There was never a point in my life where I didn't shave both or I, I shaved one, but not the other. Right. You know, I, I never shaved just my legs and kept my arms hairy. I was like, shaving your legs is faster. Well, obviously shaving your arms <laughs> is faster as well. So I'll just do them both. This is what I'm saying about the arrow bars conversation. I was like, oh, arrow bars are faster. They're on my bike. End of discussion. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Somebody needs to tell him to shave his arms for sure. Well, any more unbound drama? It doesn't uh, have to do with arrow bars. Um, I thought that uh, Sophia's post after after her win was was pretty hilarious. She was talking about how some journalist uh, was saying that she was a gravel newbie, like she. They, they were talking about the Lifetime series, right? And um, they were saying that Sophia was probably going to do well in the mountain bike races or something, but she's a gravel newbie, right? So probably not not a favorite for Unbound or, or something along those lines, right? And she's like, that got under my skin enough that I made Unbound a priority race for me, and now I'm the queen of gravel. Which is yeah about that's pretty a, epic <laughs> which is about as boss move as you could possibly be <laughs> um yeah i mean i you know she she wasn't she was obviously on my radar for like women who i thought could do well there but mm -hmm. i wouldn't have picked her as the winner um, yeah so so i was i was doing this strategy where you know i was I was trying to be consistent with my pacing and not blow up, which meant I was in like probably 115th place at mile 25. There were so many people ahead of me because I was riding consistently. And then I was just catching people throughout the day. And so when I caught up to her group, she was in like the second group of guys on the road and the group was like 15 dudes and she was just chilling in the back with no other women. And I was like, hold. She is getting such an advantage right now. Um, 
because I'd, I'd passed Lauren DiCrescenzo like 15 minutes earlier, and Lauren was by herself, I think, or maybe with a small group of like two or three riders. And I was like, dang, like that's a good position for her to be in right now. Um, I was, I was maybe a little worried that she burnt too many matches to get with that group, but clearly she didn't. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I was looking at like the time splits throughout the day and I saw, I think it was Leah Davidson was like up there in like the top 10 mm -hmm. in a group and she was the only woman up there in the beginning, but then I'm looking at the results and she finished like an hour and a half behind Sophia. Yeah. That's what but I'm I don't know. If that's what I'm saying yeah. about this race. Like people, yeah. people will def. It happened less this year, and I think that's because of the heat. But people will definitely go too hard at the beginning, and then just the second half is like a slog to get to the finish. Like you're just right. It feel it still feels easy early on. Mm, like right. It, it's no problem to stay in that group, but you just haven't experienced what it's going to feel like eight hours into a race. Exactly. So, so if you were trying to even pace your your speed, mm -hmm. would you would that be like a negative split with power? Because in the beginning, uh, you like have more advantage with drafting. No, it was actually it actually ended up being a positive split with power, and that's because I think the second half of the race, the roads are slightly faster, and there was a slight tailwind. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't planning to positive split with power. If anything, I'd, I would have liked to have negative split with power, but it's just how it ended up. Um, but, uh, the, so I recruited like five dudes to do this with me. So I wouldn't be alone. And only like one on of those. Line? No, no. Like I texted them like a week. Before. This was a different email chain. It was a different <laughs> email did, chain. Like a sub thread. And I was like, you chain. better run All the guys it. with arrow. I was like, All you the guys better run arrow, arrow bars. <laughs> End of discussion, <laughs> right? And they all they all did have arrow bars. One dude was not going to run them, and I convinced him to run them. Um, but uh, so a lot of them were my flow teammates, and I hope they don't get mad at me for saying this, but they were not super helpful, to be honest with you. <laughs> the one dude that was was helpful was uh, this guy Chase, who is on that Mazda Lauf team. He stayed with me for like 130 miles, but. So it wasn't like it was just the two of us, though. Like, we kept catching riders who were either either cracked or, or like, get dropped off the front group or they had flats or some, some other issue. So, like, we caught Brennan Wirtz. We caught, um, we caught Jasper because uh, Jasper had a flat. Um, like, we, we kept – we caught uh, Alex Howes, Andrew Lesby, um probably forgetting some names, but like we caught some strong dudes that were very helpful in the chase. Like there was no part of the day except for the last 20 minutes of the race where I was solo. So I, I, I am kind of scratching my head thinking like, what if I had tried to stay with the, do the typical strategy of trying to stay with the front group as long as I can? Um, like would I have gotten like is would have, being in a group of that size been such a drafting benefit that I would have, you know, been, I would have been further up the road when I got dropped and I would have had more of a drafting benefit for more of the race. There's no way to know. Right. Um, because yeah, this, I, mean, I, would, I would think like you're gonna, it'd be hard to negative split with power, you know, like mm -hmm. you're gonna positive split. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's not impossible to negative split with power, but it's certainly difficult. So you might as well, like, burn a few matches in the beginning to stay with the front group. <laughs> yeah, I think... <laughs> not so, burn a match, so, but, like, you know, not so, drop off, like, easily, right? Yeah, I will say that that's, that's probably the mentality that most people have, and it actually ends up burning them in the second half of the race. Okay. But are people just a little too, like, ambitious with what group they think they'll fit in? I mean, sure. Everybody is a little too ambitious, right? When it's race day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even even like the front group at the end, the front group of five guys, uh, those guys weren't in a lot of the earlier moves. There, there were there were yeah, some long. I think, well, I, I think guess um, Lawrence Ten Dam. Lawrence was um, yeah. Solo. He soloed off the front for a long time. Yeah. Uh, 
which is pretty crazy. He sent me a, he sent me a message on Instagram. Like I posted about how I just barely got under 10 hours and he's like, the race was shortened. And I was like, <laughs> dude, it was still 200 miles of gravel. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> I was like, it, yeah. was sh- it was shortened by like four miles and I went two miles off course. So I only did two less miles than the original if, course. If it was 196 miles, then maybe I could see because it's called the Unbound 200. Right, but it was still but 200 like it shouldn't be miles. 200, yeah, it shouldn't be 204 miles. It should be 200 miles. But but if it's like a different course every year, it's yeah, like you can't really compare. It it's it is hard to it is hard to compare that. for sure. Um, but but like I said, people are people are acting like the course has never gone south before. Like it's gone south, and the last time it went south. Ted King's time was 10.45, which is over an hour slower than the winning time this year. It's slower than the, the women's time this year. Like, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's kind of, I, I think there's there's two explanations for it. The competition has gotten so high and it wasn't hot this year. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we can we can probably wrap it up soon. We're over an hour, but um, I'm trying to yeah, think. Yeah, I think at some point we should uh, we should talk about the lifetime series a little more in depth. I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, we we can touch on the lifetime series real quick. Uh, no, we'll save it. This is good. I mean, we're at an hour already. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to get me going too much on the Lifetime Series. Yeah, we yeah. Uh, honestly we need a podcast where we're just talking about the Lifetime Series because Scott Scott's got plenty to say. Yeah, <laughs> I've got a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> In good ways, I, I've got suggestions for how it could be improved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, constructive criticism. Totally right. Right. Sweet. All right. Sweet. All right. Well, I guess we'll end it there. All right. Let's wrap it up.